The inspiration for the Hands on Hedges project was a series of visits made to Northern Ireland by my great-grandfather George Midgley in the late 1930s. He was a Yorkshire farmer who was also an expert in the craft of laying hedges. In 1936, Josias Cunningham, a stockbroker and member of the wealthy and prominent Belfast family, was 37. He had been the owner of Crooked Stone, his family's former farm at Crumlin, County Antrim, for a year. Built by his family in the 17th century, it had passed out of family ownership for a hundred years. Badly neglected for a long time, he was investing and working enthusiastically to bring it back to life. In his diary for April the 9th, 1936, he noted that he had been to see a hedge-laying demonstration at Hill Dickinson's at Ballygowan. He must have been impressed with what he had seen, as he had asked the men to come to him for two months the next season. Over in Yorkshire, George Midgley was the tenant farmer on the Old B estate at Burt's Farm Buttercrum near Stamford Bridge. The youngest of 13 children, he had inherited the tenancy of the 180-acre mixed farm in 1902, at the age of 30 from his father James. He was a lively, jovial character, with a reputation for being a fearless stockman with the shorthorn bulls that he kept on the farm, and for being a dap hand with the osses, and also for being able to turn his hand to anything. Someone once said of him, Give old George Midgley a ball of Massey Harris, bale of twine, and a handful of horseshoe nails, and he'll fix anything. He was also active in the community, including instructing courses for the local young farmers in Hedge Lane, with certificates awarded by the Department of Agriculture of the University of Leeds. But in 1936, things were not so good for George. His daughter Daisy recalled, I remember a night when my dad had been sitting for hours doing his accounts. At about ten o'clock when he'd finished, he said, Well, lads, we've just lost sixteen pound per acre on all of the taties we've grown. We'd prepared the land, we'd rowed them up, we'd sown the potatoes and hoed them, and all the other work, and then picked them and put them into the tatie pie before winter. And when it came to selling them, we couldn't even give them away. By 1937, George had decided to retire from the farm. He was sixty-five, and his sons either had their own farms or were working elsewhere. The tenancy was handed back and the farm contents sold. I don't know how the connection was originally made, but in November 1937, George travelled to Northern Ireland for the first time to do some hedge laying for Josiah's Cunningham. He noted in his farm diary, I met George Midgley of Stamford Bridge, York at the Haitian boat November the 20th, 1937. I sent him a return ticket for one pound, eighteen shillings and tenpence from York to Belfast. I had a very good reference from D.H. Finillay, agricultural organiser of Greyfriars, Leicester. We know about the trip because of the wonderful letters home that George wrote, full of his excitement and enjoyment of his reception. The hedge I started on is 500 yards. I have a lot of lookers-on as well as helpers. I had a speech day last Friday. 38 students from Agricultural College Antrim. Some of them are coming to work and on December 8th it advertised in papers for people to come and see expert hedge cutter giving demonstrations and instructions. There's miles of hedge ripe for felling. This chap where I am, Mr Cunningham, when I started, I don't think he liked it much. He got me started on the Saturday with two blokes. I've got one going nicely with an axe. When he saw a length finished, he was delighted, and he went in his car and fetched some pals. And oh, what tough questions they ask. The picture is of George showing a finished hedge at Crooked Stones in December 1937. He's posing with his axe and is still wearing his leather leggings over his boots. In all, he was to work three times for Josiah's Cunningham 
and each time Mr. Cunningham not only carefully recorded in his farm diaries the hedges that had been worked on, the distances laid, and the amounts paid, but also showed them on plans of the farm. George made such an impression that after just over a month at home he was invited to return in the late January of 1938, this time bringing his son Hubert with him to assist. He did another three days' work for Mr Cunningham before starting on a programme of twelve demonstrations in two weeks in County Down, and then two weeks in County Derry, doing eleven demonstrations, including two days at the first international ploughing competition. After that, they returned to Crooked Stones and worked for a month on the hedges there and at nearby Shane's Castle. George was working for the County Down and County Derry Agricultural Committees when he was doing these demonstrations. These committees had been established throughout Britain during the First World War with the aim of improving agriculture and agricultural education, and they had been formalised in the 1919 Agriculture Act. The County London Derry Agricultural Committee Annual Report for 1938 has an entry in it about George Midgley's demonstrations. This was his two-week programme in County Down. Dear Daisy, I'm sending you a line just to let you know we're having a great reception over here. If you would listened in to Northern Ireland on Monday night, you would have heard about us and our programme. We are at a fresh place every day. If you have a map, you can see where we are on the sea coast. Donagda, Ballywalter, Clocky, Portaferry, Killy, Downpatrick, Ballynahinch, Cronlier, Newtonards. On Saturday we go to Maria. That's our finish in Down. It's a grand place for a holiday. This was a big feature in the Northern Whig newspaper in February 1938. The newspaper was owned by the Cunningham family at this time. It's no good me trying to tell you what this country is like, as it's the finest place I ever saw. We was on the sea coast last week, about 17 miles ride on the coast road, and close to the sea at play. Some days the crowd is so big we can't work for them, and everybody's very good to us. We had a very large photo in a paper last week. I expect we shall be photoed at Limavadi. There is a big entry for ploughing, and they expect 8,000 people. I am sending our programme for this week. They've asked me if I should be at liberty next September. They seem to have had hedges here before, but not like us. We have great crowds every day. They say we had over 500 to see us on Monday. I've had to go to two JP's fine places to tell the gardeners how to cut a hedge. And tomorrow have to give advice to a chap that's an MP. We've had a big crowd again today to see us. And we're here until Saturday morning. And then we're going to Derry on Sunday. We expect a big day tomorrow, which is Wednesday. We're at the Mayor of Coleraine's. He came for me on Sunday to go and choose a hedge for work to cut. I've been taken to four posh places to advise them how to cut privet hedges, where they have gardeners. One place an MP, one a doctor, two JPs, and now the Mayor. So you can see we're among them. They've already asked if we can come back in autumn and as a, about a supply of tools for young farmers. Hubert says they'd better let him get some to bring back. I think he likes this life all right. We had a smart young lady met us today to take us and bring us back to the station. She told us the Agricultural Committee had been trying to get someone for two years. One of the highlights of this part of the visit was the first international ploughing match which was held at Limavadi. Well, I must say we are having a royal time. 
I don't know what to tell you first, as everything is so grand. We've had two days at Limavady, and the crowds was far more bigger than anybody expected. There was near as fifty thousand of anything. Men could hardly plough for them, and I just stood and talked and answered questions, as I have to do every day. And for horses, this, Mr. Drennan, is the place for Clydesdale. You see, his farm is six hundred and fifty acres. The field where the ploughing was is fifty, and where tractors was another fifty. Hubert went to try to get some cigs, but couldn't get within fifty yards of the tent. It was like a race meeting. Three car trick men and all sorts. The mayor told me we had to walk three miles from where he could park his car. George then returned to do three weeks' work at Mr Cunningham's and one week's work at Shane's Castle in Antrim. It was a busy programme for a retired man. He finally returned home to Yorkshire at the end of March 1938. George was back again in Northern Ireland in February 1939, along with Hubert to assist, to do another programme of demonstrations for the County Down Committee for Agriculture. Dear Mother, I received your letter on Saturday, so I'm sending a few lines to let you know we're off on Monday again for a week to a new address. We demonstrate at Lisbon on Monday. It's about 30 miles ride. I don't think they would let us come home if we could hedge all summer. We are having fine weather. We have only had two wet days, both Saturdays, so we are doing well. I think hedges are going to get too forward in leaf to cut much longer, but expect Mr Cunningham will want us two weeks after next. Hubert and me was weighed last Sunday, and we are about seven pounds each heavier than when we came. I expected to have some more photos before now, but she'll be having some next week. George and Hubert returned to work for Mr Cunningham at the beginning of March, although this was cut short by continuous heavy rain. This was to be his last visit to Northern Ireland. The war broke out late that year, and he died of erysipelas in September 1943 at the age of 70. The outbreak of war saw a change in priorities for everyone, Maximum food production, with the minimum of manpower being one of them. At a time when everyone was needed for the war effort, labour-intensive craft skills such as hedge laying that he had demonstrated and which had been received so enthusiastically were relegated as more and more machinery was introduced and larger prairie-style farming was encouraged. In the changing post-war world, many of the young men who had watched the demonstrations would never return to the farms. For many years, George's visits were forgotten. Many of the hedges that he worked on were grubbed out by changing land use. Others gradually grew out. And then, during about a family history research, the letters, photographs and newspaper clippings that had been carefully preserved by his daughter, Daisy, my grandma, came to light. I transcribed and copied them as part of a larger family history project, and then I thought that they might be of interest to those who were trying to preserve and encourage this ancient craft and so I sent copies to the UK Hedge Laying Association. I heard nothing for a long time, but the information had reached Neil Folkes of the Hedge Laying Association of Ireland, and, intrigued by the story, he saw the potential of using it to encourage a new series of demonstrations to a new generation of farmers and others involved in the countryside. Following a successful application to the Lottery Fund, the Hands-On Hedges project was born. Uh, well, I suppose originally what we were looking to do was to try and promote the fact that hedge laying is still needed. Um, we know George Midgley in his letters um, home said that about hundreds of miles ripe for felling, ripe for laying, and the situation is still the same. We definitely need lots of lots of hedge laying done to 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 ensure a, a viable hedgerow population into the future. 
Uh, we were looking to, to frame a project to go to the Heritage Lottery Fund and we obviously needed a heritage angle and the George Midgley story is a perfect angle to, to, to look at the old and the new, what was done in 37, 38, 39 uh, and what we could do is try and replicate that and build on it and say well this was done then and it's still relevant now. So that's what we were trying to achieve. One of the aims of the project was to see what the results of George's work were on the landscape today. Many of the original demonstration sites were tracked down by members of the Hedge Laying Association of Ireland, and people were interviewed who could still remember seeing him work all those years ago. There are still some faint traces of his work to be seen in the hedgerows of Northern Ireland, over 70 years later. But one of the directors of the programme, Paul O'Hagan, has one regret. I, I, I just I wish it had been started about 30 years ago when we could saw more of George Mitchley's work. You know, the, the big problem is that you're going, too many years have lapsed and uh, we can't see the extent of the work that he put onto the hedge or the results from it, you know. A uh, big problem, maybe there wasn't enough aftercare and uh, that happens all over the country, not only on this site, like here. And uh, it just leaves that we're lucky to see some of us good work. I hope that you have found this interesting. If you want more information, the Hedge Laying Association of Ireland runs training courses, sells tools, and can provide lists of qualified hedge layers.